Recently I made a reaction to Heritage Minute videos uh, from Historica Canada. Now, as the name suggests, these are short one minute videos that give great insight into important moments and amazing figures in the history of Canada. I really enjoyed it. The, the production value of the videos was really great level. It really drew you into every story, even though they were only a minute. It kind of described in detail what happened. Uh, with these highly produced videos. I loved them and for me what they actually did is they really inspired a desire to learn more about not just his, ca Canada's history in general but these specific stories that I learned briefly about in those videos and that's what I'm going to do in the coming weeks. I'll be picking out some of those stories and others uh, to learn more about and if there's any other Heritage Minute videos that I never watched in there that you want me to react to Tell me in the comments and I'll make another video doing that. Uh, one of the stories that really grabbed my attention was this, the Halifax Explosion. Uh, many people told me about it in the comments as well, told me to actually watch this documentary, learn more about the specific situation. Uh, it's one of the biggest explosions of a non-nuclear non uh, variety that's ever happened in the history of Earth. 2,000 people lost their lives, 9,000 people were injured. It's just an absolutely... Horrific story, but a momentous occasion, not just in Canadian history, but in the history of the world. Something that everybody should know about, and I can't wait to learn more about, about it, so let's check it out. This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. I'll put the link to this video, so go follow this channel as well. Fascinating horror. The Halifax Explosion. On the 6th of December, 1917, two ships collided in the mouth of Halifax Harbour in Nova Scotia, Canada. The collision sparked a fire on board one of the vessels, a repurposed tramp steamer packed with a cargo of explosives bound for the European theatre of war. Mm. So that's why I never knew that it wasn't mentioned in the video. I asked why was this ship filled with explosion uh, explosives, but obviously this 1917 is during the First World War, that's where it was going. It was taking explosives to the First World War. So a, a tremendously fragile cargo, and for it to have this collision, it's a, the most unfortunate accident that could ever happen. Look at the plume of smoke that actually emanated from this situation. It's crazy to think about. At exactly 35 seconds after 9.04 a.m., this cargo detonated, bringing about one of the largest non-nuclear explosions ever to take place. Halifax Harbour is a large, natural harbour on the Atlantic coast of Canada. It consists of a huge enclosed bay, known as the Bedford Basin, as well as a slender strait, known as the Narrows, which leads out towards open ocean, passing a few small islands on the way. On one side of Halifax Harbour, in 1917, was the town of Halifax. On the other side stood Dartmouth. Mm. Between them, the two towns had a combined population of around 65,000 people. This population had recently grown. The ongoing First World War made the harbour of great strategic importance. Mm. It was a key departure point for convoys of ships bound for Europe. Okay, okay, never knew It that. was an incredibly important port, and was thus busier during the war than it ever had been before. A few days before the disaster, the Norwegian ship the SS Imo, arrived at Halifax Harbour and docked in the Bedford Basin, where it sat for several days awaiting supplies. Some of these, namely the ship's required load of coal, were delayed. Although cleared to leave on the 5th of December, the Imo didn't complete loading until too late in the day to depart. Submarine nets, designed to protect the ships at anchor in the Bedford Basin from attack by German U-boats, had been raised for the night. That's the thing I never knew as well. I never knew Germans were actually attacking Canadian land. Uh, and I never knew of the importance of this harbour. So even things like this is very interesting for me to find out. Obviously, I know of Canada's roles in military conflicts alongside like the British and things like this. But to really see the how it was geographically is very interesting. And therefore, very interesting. no ship could pass in or out. Hmm. Although anxious to get underway, the crew of the Emo would have to wait until the next morning. Meanwhile, 
the French cargo ship, the SS Montblanc, was in a similar predicament outside the harbour. It had arrived too late in the day to be allowed to enter the Bedford Basin, and so was forced to wait outside the harbour until the submarine nets were lowered again the next morning. The crew of the Mont Blanc would no doubt have preferred to spend the night with the ship moored safely inside the harbour, especially considering the cargo it carried. On board was a staggering amount of explosive materials, including TNT, gun cotton, picric acid, and barrel upon barrel of tar-like benzol. Mm. Wow. Whatever fears the crew of the Mont Blanc might have had, the night passed uneventfully. At 7.30am on the morning of the 6th of December, the submarine nets were lowered and both ships started moving once more, the Emo heading out of Halifax Harbour and the Mont Blanc heading inwards. Normally, ships passing through the Narrows were expected to stay on the right and to adhere to a speed limit of just 5 knots, about the pace of a swift jog. On this particular day though, the captain of the Emo was so keen to get moving that he ignored the speed limit and mm. surged into the Narrows at a much faster speed. See that? That's things like that. Is that that's quite scary, man. This is the captain of the ship and he's just going against the regulations like in such a... You can even see just looking at that geographically how thin that, that passageway is to actually make that decision. Oh, it's quite terrible, actually. At this point, the Emo encountered two other vessels, one after the other. First was the SS Clara, an American tramp steamer, coming into the harbour on the wrong side of the Narrows. The two boats signalled to one another, and the Emo ultimately moved towards the middle of the Narrows to avoid a collision. Moments later, the Emo encountered the tugboat Stella Maris, which was travelling down the centre of the strait. Again, the Emo moved aside, this time going from a position near the middle of the Narrows to completely the wrong side. So that was how the Emo wrong. came to be on a collision course with the inbound Mont Blanc. The two ships sighted one another when they were still more than 1.2 kilometres, around three quarters of a mile, apart, and began a series of frantic signals. The Mont Blanc had right of way, but the crew of the Emo, for whatever reason, indicated that they would not yield. That's, is that when it became just clear that the end result of this game of chicken would be a catastrophic collision, both ships cut their engines. The Mont Blanc tried to steer around the drifting Emo, and might have made it had the Emo not reversed its engines at exactly the wrong moment. The effect of this was to cause the nose of the Emo to swing into the hull of the Mont Blanc. The collision took place at a relatively low speed, and although quite damaging, did not immediately scuttle either boat. However, several barrels of the Mont Blanc's flammable cargo were ruptured in the smash, resulting in a huge spill of highly flammable material. Even at this point though, a disaster was not yet assured. Without a spark, even the most explosive materials would not catch fire. Okay, okay. For a moment, the boats drifted. Then, the Emo's engines kicked in once again, and the two damaged vessels parted ways. As they did so, metal scraped upon metal. Mm. Sparks flew, and a fire began on board the Mont Blanc. Recognising the danger, the captain of the Mont Blanc, Amy Lemedic, ordered his crew to abandon ship. They needed no further encouragement to do so. Piling into lifeboats, they rowed for the shore, shouting desperate warnings to anyone they could see. Alas, such was the noise and confusion out on the water that very few people on nearby boats or watching from the shore actually heard or understood these warnings. Mm. The Mont Blanc itself drifted, blazing, towards the Halifax side of the Narrows, eventually beaching itself beside Pier 6 of the harbour. A huge plume of smoke rose into the air above it, and people on both sides of the water were drawn to their windows or to the waterfront in order to watch the drama unfold. Can you only imagine the horror that these people... I mean, at that time they might not have even really understood what was going on. They might have just thought it was a fire from the boat and just been thinking, like, oh, it's not that much of a problem. 
the, the horror that was to unfold, but the captain of that emo man, the emo boat, like, I, I, it seems like a series of unfortunate incidents, especially with those, the tugboat just going down the middle and pushing that emo to the other side. But the moment where they decided just to not yield and just drive uh, straight forward to, towards the Mont Blanc seems like an utterly disgraceful decision uh, by the emo. At 9.04 a.m. and 35 seconds, the cargo on board the Mont Blanc detonated. The explosion was a huge one. The blast destroyed everything within 2.6 kilometers, or 1.6 miles, of the grounded ship. Beyond that, severe damage was done to thousands of buildings, and hot fragments of metal rained down across the city. It's like the apocalypse. A gun from the deck of the Mont Blanc was launched into the air, and touched down again 5.6 kilometers, or 3.5 miles, away. Jeez. The shockwave travelled at many times the speed of sound, and was felt across the whole of Nova Scotia. Buildings disintegrated, trees were flattened, cars tumbled, and ships lifted completely from the harbour and dumped onto land. Oh my. In the space of a moment, around 1,600 people were instantly killed, and many more were seriously injured. Victims were buried beneath rubble, hit by flying debris, and in many cases received serious eye injuries as the windows they had been looking through exploded yeah, into shards of glass. Oh. As well as the destructive force of the blast, the explosion created a tsunami, a crashing six-story wall of water that surged into the leveled city, crushing and drowning many of those who had survived the initial blast. Oh man, this is, this is horrifying. This is this is why like I, I feel like sad. I, I, I obviously it's a sad situation. I, you, you never really want to hear sad stories, but to, you, these are situations that people need to be aware of and understand what happened and know about to pay respect to the many victims here. Like so many people lost their life in such horrific ways. It's utterly you just can't imagine it. It's really hard to understand how these decisions made by people on a boat really led to such destruction and devastation. The Straight Emo hard. was one of many ships swept up by this tsunami. As it was thrown from the harbour, almost everyone on board was killed. Worse yet, as the water receded, fires began to burn in the wreckage. The explosion had destroyed boilers, collapsed factories, and knocked over domestic stoves. Now, the rubble caught fire, turning the rescue effort into a race Jeez. against time. Time was not on the side of the rescuers. Since the explosion had taken place in the context of the First World War, the natural assumption of many was that it had so been due attack. to enemy action. Yeah, that's true, you would think that, actually. Rather than immediately focusing on rescue, soldiers ran to their posts to defend against further attack. Oh, just so much going wrong. That, that is just so coincidental that... I mean, it's not coincidental in the fact that the, the, the cargo of that boat was for the war, so if there wasn't a war, they, that ship probably wouldn't have had that cargo in it. And at that time, obviously, it would be your immediate thought is to think it's an attack by the enemy. So you can see why the soldiers would be sent to do something other than rescue people. Just, as I mentioned, very unfortunate it was only after some instances. hours had passed that the true source of the explosion was widely understood. Rescue work was grim and lengthy. Mm. Firefighters from across the province were joined by police and military, as well as hundreds of shell-shocked volunteers. They dug through the wreckage, pulling out any survivors they could find. These were sent to the city's remaining medical facilities. A deluge of thousands of seriously injured casualties arrived at every available hospital mm. in a matter of hours. It must have been so tough for the Several military workers. vessels that had been close at the time of the explosion diverted to offer assistance, and were promptly converted into makeshift hospital ships. Although injured and shocked by what had happened, everyone present did whatever they could to help. There are even reports of children volunteering to carry messages across the town. Oh. This rescue effort was, however, soon complicated by worsening weather. The day after the explosion, 
when hundreds of people were still injured, homeless, and trapped beneath rubble, a blizzard descended on the city, bringing below freezing temperatures and 1.2 meters, or 4 feet, of snow. Not only did these horrendous conditions present a challenge for rescuers, but they also stopped relief from reaching the city. Yeah, that's true. Trains carrying medical supplies and food were forced to stop in place in zero visibility, even though their supplies were desperately needed within the blast zone. The Halifax explosion, then, was a disaster of many dimensions. Yeah, that's true. Multi-dimension. As such, the number of dead is difficult to estimate, but stands at around 2,000 in total, mm. with a further 9,000 people suffering serious injury. I, I know I watched the Heritage Minute video about this, a one-minute video, and I really understood the horrific nature but really, when it go, you see this documentary going into detail, then you really understand the gravity of the horror that was that actually occurred at this time. It was not just an explosion that killed. There was just so much ongoing problems and uh, just terrible things that happened. Like it's quite hard to. As soon as the situation on the ground about. was under control, an inquiry was launched to establish who had been to blame for the incident. It might seem logical that the captain of the Emo was to blame for the disaster. After all, the Emo had been speeding through the Narrows just before the collision. Mm. It had been on the wrong side of the strait and had refused to yield even when signalled by the Mont Blanc. However, the presiding judge, Mr Justice Arthur Drysdale, had little hesitation in blaming the crew of the Mont Blanc, who he right. alleged had failed to follow the rules concerning the movement of ships. There were likely several reasons behind this rather one-sided judgement, not least of which was a great deal of public anger. Given that the crew of the Emo had almost all been killed in the explosion, this anger was focused largely on the surviving crew of the Mont Blanc, who had, after all, abandoned ship in order to save their own lives when the yeah. fire began. Okay, yeah, that's true in a way, Three men it's very were charged complex. with manslaughter. They included Amy Lemedek, the captain of the Mont Blanc, Francis Mackey, a harbour pilot, and Frederick Evans Wyatt, the chief examining officer of Halifax Harbour. However, none of these men were ever brought to trial, as there simply wasn't enough evidence to do so. Mm. In any event, the ruling that the Mont Blanc alone had been at fault was overturned by the Supreme Court of Canada in 1919. Mm. And it was established that both ships had made errors, which contributed to the disaster. Yeah, I think that's that's fair to say. Despite the devastation of Halifax, some positive outcomes did arise from the disaster. The rules concerning harbour navigation and the storage of hazardous materials were changed to make a repeat of the explosion unlikely. Beyond this, the huge rescue efforts served to inform and bolster charitable organisations within Canada. The massive number of eye injuries caused by flying glass, for example, led directly to the founding of the Canadian National Institute for the Blind mm. a few years later. While the extensive rescue effort underlined the importance of the Red Cross and helped them to grow into the humanitarian organisation they are today. That, I mean, is, as I've said several times, it's a terrible, terrible situation, but to see the ca Canadian me mentality the Canadian personality in taking this terrible situation and just trying to extract as much positive actions out of it as possible. It's fantastic to see how they, with these chari charities and changing regulations and things, things like this may happen in other countries and it might not lead, people might just try and brush it under the carpet and not face it. Canadian people in Canada here and the, the people of Halifax have said, okay, we're going to learn from this. We're going to implement uh, processes to make sure it never happens again. We're also going to increase charitable efforts. They're really taking a, a terrible situation and turned it as positive as they could and done some great things from that, which the I really respect. After the disaster, there was a huge need for housing, and this led to the construction of one of the first public housing projects in Canada, known as the Hydrostone. Some of the dwellings constructed during this time are still in place today, okay. providing a home to Halifax's modern citizens. Mm. One of the most enduring legacies from the disaster is one of civic friendship. 
Boston was one of the first cities to send aid to Halifax, and this aid arrived at a crucial time, mm. just as the blizzard was setting in. The help provided by Boston was vital in saving lives and relieving medical staff and rescuers. As a thank you for this vital support at the most difficult time in its history, Nova Scotia donated a Christmas tree to the city of Boston. Wow. That's so Many nice. years later, this became a tradition, uh, and to this day, Nova Scotia provides Boston with a tree. That's so heartwarming, I really love Though that. devastated by the explosion that rocked the harbour on the 6th of December 1917, Halifax has risen from the ruins. Today, it is a thriving maritime city, home to more than 400,000 people. The Halifax explosion remains a painful but vital part of its history, and reminders of the suffering, the loss, and the heroism of rescuers are everywhere. Though the city has recovered, the Halifax explosion will never be forgotten. Wow. That, that's the way it should be as well. That's why learning about these, th these things is so important. There is important. one final, and at least somewhat positive, coda to the story of the Halifax explosion. That of Patrick Vincent Coleman. I'm able to include this story in this extra long episode, thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Surfshark VPN. Go to surfshark.deals forward slash fascinating, and use the code fascinating to get 83% off a two year plan. Now, here's the story of Patrick Vince Coleman, a man whose actions on the 6th of December 1917 saved an untold number of lives. Yeah, I think on the Heritage Minutes I seen briefly his role, I think that was to do with stopping the train, but really interested to hear more about his, his Vince role. Vince Coleman was a train dispatcher for Canadian Government Railways. On the day of the disaster he was working at Richmond Station, not far from Pier 6, where the burning Mont Blanc ran aground. Mm, so close. He would have had a clear view of the plumes of smoke rising from the burning vessel, and would no doubt have been deeply alarmed when a sailor dashed up to him and his colleagues to inform them that they must evacuate, mm. as the burning boat was laden with explosives. Coleman and his colleagues, quite understandably, ran for their lives. Before getting very far, however, Coleman turned around and sprinted back to the telegraph office at Richmond Station. From there, he started sending out one final, desperate message. Hold up the train. Ammunition ship a fire in harbour, making for Pier 6, and will explode. Guess this will be my last message. Goodbye, boys. Oh. Coleman's message was most likely intended for one particular train the Overnight Express from New Brunswick. This service, carrying around 300 passengers, was due to arrive within just a few minutes, and would have passed directly by the burning Mont Blanc when it did. Thanks to Coleman's actions, however, it was halted on the other side of the Bedford Basin, and 300 innocent people lived to see another day. Whoa. That is, that is an unbelievable act of heroism. Can you imagine being in that situation? Someone tells you there's this this boat that's potentially about to explode so close to your current situation. A lot of people would lose their head and lose composure and de do just run away and save themselves. He had the, the calmness, the thought to actually, the foresight to know that there was a train coming, but not only that, to take the action necessary at that moment to run back and send that message, which when you actually read the words of it, like talking about this will be my last message, it's harrowing, but the, the, the act of heroism from Vince is just, that that's something in, on, in of its own, apart from this whole situation, that moment of heroism is something that should be learned and something that should be known by as many people as possible. That's an inspirational action, uh, saved 300 people, a train full of people that could have just been, they've lost, could, would have lost their lives, that's what would have happened if it wasn't for him. Moreover, his message was relayed to many other stations, oh, instantly wow. halting inbound freight and passenger trains, and also alerting telegraph operators across Nova Scotia and beyond to the impending disaster. Wow. When the Mont Blanc exploded, 
The wheels were already in motion to begin delivering rescuers, supplies, equipment and aid to the victims of the disaster. Coleman, as he had predicted in his final message, did not survive. Uh. The explosion hit him with such force that it blew the hands from his pocket watch. Death would have been instant. Uh, it's, it's absolutely heartbreaking, man. That guy gave up his life to save not just, as it, as I said further earlier, not just those 300 people, but aid, potentially other people coming into the city if they were going to give the aid. And He gave his life for so much. That was like the ultimate sacrifice, but he should always be remembered. His legacy, however, lives on not just in the lives he saved, but in his presence as an enduring figure in history. I, I like a symbol of the many heroes who sacrificed themselves during the years of the First World War mm. in order to preserve the lives of others. Exactly. Today, Coleman's telegraph key and damaged pocket watch are preserved in the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic in Nova Scotia. Wow, okay. Though he has been dead for over 100 years, by virtue of actions taken in the final few seconds of his life, Vince Coleman stands to be remembered for centuries to come. That's, that's as he should be. Ah, oh, that is, I mean, that's exactly what I was looking for with regards to finding out more about these Heritage Minutes videos and getting a deeper insight into these moments in history of the history of Canada and also the, the people of Canada as well, the important people of, the Canadi of Canadian history. This was an absolutely harrowing story of a situation I feel... I feel ashamed that I never knew about this before, especially Vin the story of Vince and his heroism. But this is what this channel is all about for me to learn and educate myself and find out about these these stories, the Halifax explosion. This is, I hope that like other people can learn about this as well that don't know about it. Uh, but for me, I just feel enriched to learn about this part of uh, Canada's history. Uh, sad, sad time, obviously a terrible time. Uh, but it's something obviously we need to learn about when we're learning about the history of different places. And yeah. Tell me what you think about this. Tell me if you're from Halifax, how this still affects the, the city. Tell me if you're from the, uh, from the rest of Canada, what you think about the situation, when you learned about it, what you take from the story. Uh, and yeah, thank you for recommending this one and I'll, I'll look forward to like recommend, uh, reacting to some more stories about Canadian history. Thanks. <laughs>